program on Ocean Change Winter Seminar Series. Um, for those of you who are live tweeting, our hashtag is UWICOC, in all capitals. Um, today we are pleased to welcome Dr. Mary Nefferkoff. Mary is a consulting professor at Stanford University and the managing director of the Natural Capital Project, which is a collaboration between Stanford, the World Wildlife Fund, the Nature Conservancy, and the University of Minnesota. Mary received her bachelor's degree in human biology from Stanford and a master's in fisheries and doctorate in botany from the University of Washington. She has managed the ecosystem science program at NOAA's Northwest Fisheries Science Center and was the chief scientist for the Puget Sound Partnership. At the Natural Capital Project, Mary works to incorporate ecosystem services into models so that they can be considered when evaluating different management decisions. Her career in marine conservation is exemplified by the idea that human development and conservation do not go against each other, but in fact, healthy ecosystems are vital for healthy human populations. Today, we are excited to hear her perspective on ocean change, entitled Nature of, By, and For People. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mayra. Part. 
And then I'll focus a lot on this last part, which is if we think about nature and its functions and how it affects our well-being, I think we'll find better and more innovative solutions than we have from locking up nature. So of the people, it's really the, the numbers that we hear a lot. There's 7 billion people um, coming soon, 9 billion. And a lot of the pressures that come from people's activities are partly numbers, but as many of you know, human population size is actually asymptoting, it's flattening out. But it's going to be shifts in diets and livelihoods that come with development as populations grow and develop that's going to continue to put pressure on natural resources for quite a long time, even after population growth stabilizes. And one of the big drivers of that is consumption. Um, I don't know how many of you people know Chris Jordan's work. He's from Tacoma. He's a photographer. This is part of what he does. He takes these amazing photos to show how things that humans do to consume affects nature. So these are paper bags and have one of his statistics of how many paper supermarket bags are used in the U.S. each hour. This is dated and surely not true in Seattle anymore with the bag thing. And then shows the beautiful forest of birch trees from those photographs. Okay, so by the people, this is sort of the crux of this conservation uh, identity crisis that's going on. Some people say since 13% of the land on Earth is in protected status, that's where a lot of the conservation science and conservation practice has been putting its energy. But what about the other 87% of the surface, and what could we be doing to think about how to manage those lands and waters better? And it's even worse in the ocean, where a really small fraction of the oceans are in fully protected reserves. So what about the 99.9 percenters and those people, what they could do to help protect ocean functions for people and biodiversity and whatever else you like about the oceans. So that's really the argument for those people who say, let's not focus up solely on protected areas and reserves and think about the larger matrix landscape and oceanscape between those. And that leads you to for the people. So this idea of ecosystem services or benefits from nature is not a new idea. There were books written about it decades ago, and many of you know about the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that really codified the language and the terms. So it's really the full suite of benefits that humans get from nature, and it includes happiness and existence value. So it's not just um, food and um, sort of goods, it's also these spiritual and existence things. So biodiversity counts in this ecosystem service framework, just to get all the terms out here. It, it counts in an existence way, so biodiversity for its own sake is included in these ecosystem service accounting frameworks. But also there's been some interesting reviews lately, like this one last year in Nature, showing what is the real correlation for many, many studies, so over 1,600 papers, lots of experiments looking at the relationship between biodiversity on land and in the ocean and the functions and services that are provided to people. There's, there's some interesting mixed results there, but for the most part, biodiversity and these other functions that nature provides are positively correlated. And then there's a big question about what is it worth, and it ranges from people, people's personal ideas that it's priceless, um, and there's lots of spiritual values that are uncountable and shouldn't be quantified, to lots of different ways to quantify in terms of number of people affected by disasters or not affected by disasters and markets. So I'll hit on a couple of these in showing you some examples about how we're trying to use this kind of ecosystem service information in decisions and show how it can change the way people think about managing natural resources. So that's, that's, a, that's just sort of the overview that leads into now this last part. I'll show you how we're doing this in some um, testing sort of ways. So I'll show you some examples now. Okay, so the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was was um, in the early 2000s, those of you who don't know it, it was a big global assessment of the status of the world's ecosystem services. And it really did, it was like a, an IPCC type report where there was many, many debates about all the terminology, but it really was a good first step at showing the importance of these different services and what they provide for supporting life on Earth. 
So that's been out there for a, um, a decade almost, and papers before that. There also have been lots of very specific at sort of the patch scale or much more site scale studies of looking at how the environment functions provides important services like pollination of coffee to people. So there's a lot of sort of small scale studies like that and this very high level report. But what was missing in terms of trying to turn this into how do you use this really interesting concept and put it into practice were really many medium scale kind of meso scale tools that you could use to translate these ideas into something that wasn't quite so site scale that could be larger scale, spatially explicit, looking at multiple objectives and transferable. So that's where the group that I work with comes in. That's what we've been really focusing on is looking at testing these ideas at this scale that governments, multilateral development banks, NGOs, and corporations are really making decisions. So um, we're the Natural Capital Project here with our four logos. And what we've been doing is working over the past six years to test this idea. So say, okay, take this really appealing concept of benefits for people and try to operationalize it. Try to ask, how could you provide scientifically rigorous, quantified information for decision makers who are trying to account for the value of nature in their decisions? And that's a big, diverse set of decisions. So these different letters just show the different kinds of decision contexts that we've been testing this idea in. And this shows you around the world where our first 20 demonstrations have been. So I'm going to show you just a couple of these to give you a flavor of how we work, and we can talk about others if you're interested. So here's the core of our approach, and it's called an ecological production function approach. Um, and it's really looking at this sort of general decision pathway in lots of different places. So here's the, the conceptual model. So you have some kind of alternative policy question or management option. Could be an investment or a management decision. And then the models that we develop that are, that are spatial and very simple quantification say, okay, how does that decision change the ecosystem structure? So it might change wetland area. And then we ask, how does that change the function provided by that ecosystem structure? So wetland quality and location can affect how much waves are attenuated when they're coming ashore, for example. And then the service is where people are to be affected by that ecosystem function. So if the waves are attenuated or not, that could affect erosion and flooding along the shoreline. And then the valuation step comes in by asking, okay, what is the either change in dollar value we can get from avoided damage estimates, or it could come in other currencies like number of people affected. And I'll, I'll tell you some examples about how we've been putting values on these, depending on what the audience, what our partners want. So this, this core piece right here is called the ecological production function, and that's in all the models that I'll be showing you today. So just to give you a feel for how these models work, I'll show you one of them for now. We have um, over two dozen service models. It's an open source tool on the web. You can look at it, use it anytime you want. It's, um, it's very, um, they're fa fairly simple, but you do have to know some sort of spatial GIS um, basic skills. So this is just one service. So it's protection of coastal properties or people or infrastructure. So there's always a process model in these, and this just shows some of the parameter values. So the forcing conditions are pretty basic. All these models have data that drive them that are available anywhere in the world. That's part of the agreement with our engineering <coughs> partners that has to be very broadly applicable. So it's got some very basic physical forcing functions. And then there's this attenuation process that occurs in this model that's a function of what habitats are along the shoreline. Either natural capital, in this case, it could be seagrasses or coral reefs or mangroves. It could also be built capital. So this attenuation is a function of both the hard structures and the natural structures. Then you get a hydrodynamic output. Um, and this, these equations and the whole model structure you can find on our website. I didn't put any of that in here. That shows how these structures here and the natural bathymetry affect these particular parts of 
the hydrodynamics of the coastline. So what's the wave height coming ashore at the water level and the run up in the storm surge is part of what happens when it gets on shore. And the consequences then in the services are erosion of the, of the coastline depending on what habitats are here and flooding. And then you can value that, as I mentioned before, by current season, avoided damage, or number of people affected, et cetera. So that's the basic approach, is that we're basically adding natural habitats to these basic sort of physics models and very, very engineering-oriented models and asking how does the presence or absence and quality of the natural habitats affect these process models that engineers use in this case to estimate coastal protection. So here's a simple schematic showing that same model and these little green things just show where the vegetation comes in. So we've taken, for most of our service models, we've taken existing models and added natural habitats to them where they didn't exist before. And you can see the outputs at different stages you can generate show in the presence of vegetation, the green line, what was the change in the water level, or in this case, the wave height. So this is a basically, these kinds of structures are similar to across all the service models. I'll show you some results for now. And then there's evaluation step. Sorry, that's kind of fuzzy. So in this case, for coastal protection, just carrying on this example, it's again really simple. So if you assume that this is the existing coastline, this is mean low, low water, and then there's some event that, that happens and in the absence of vegetation, the new water level, or you can think of this as an eroded shoreline, um, extends this far inland. And in the presence of vegetation, the erosion isn't as bad during, due to some event. And the difference in these two, um, with and without vegetation, is the avoided damage or the, the, uh, um, that, was, that was not occurring because of the presence of the vegetation, and you can value these parcels it's a basic um, economic technique that, that um, a lot of um, economists use in the insurance industry to estimate what's the value added of that vegetation that was there because you lost less property. Okay, so that's <coughs> sort of a, a way too quick overview of how our models work, our approaches, and there are, again, there are two dozen of these, so I could tell you more about some of them if you want to ask later, but what I want to do now is show some examples of how we apply these process models and learn a lot from the decision makers that we're working with. So I'm going to show you two examples, and the first one is in Belize where we've been working with the government on some coastal zone planning. So all of our approaches and partnerships are really trying to get at multiple objectives looking at how can we use natural capital assets in our decisions to change the way we manage the environment. So this one is a spatial planning exercise. Here's the country of Belize and the government wants to do a coastal zone plan that benefits Belizeans and the global community. So how can you disagree with that, that kind of goal? So the question is how do they incorporate the value of their environment in making this plan? So what we've done with them is, is pretty typical of our engagements in spatial planning in these different sites around the world. And they generate scenarios of different coastline development. So a very more heavily development-oriented scenario because their biggest revenue generator is tourism and they need infrastructure and hotels to support that tourism. And then there's a conservation scenario they generate, which is pretty much the state of the country now. And then they make this informed management. There's a funny process they use to very iterative to generate these um, scenarios that you may not have been interested. So what we do then, so this is one of these keys um, that was up in the north. I'm just going to show you some results from one of the keys. This is um, Ambergris Key, and San Pedro is a big city, big city, a bigger city in Belize where a lot of the tourism is. So here's their scenarios for conservation, their so-called informed management and development. That's what, what we were given to then model. What are the effects on lobster <coughs> fisheries and livelihoods, coastal protection from the reefs and seagrasses and mangroves, and tourism. Those are the three big services they wanted us to look at trade-offs. 
So in the classic case, you might come in and just start asking about one type of particular service at a time. So what if you just were interested in how shoreline development in those different scenarios affected the risk from erosion and flooding due to storms? So we can look at changes in these different habitat types that ameliorate and can attenuate those hurricanes that come through Belize. So here's a change in mangrove that we generate from a simple habitat change model as a result of their different scenarios. And then we can quantify the change in mangrove. And then we did the same thing for um, seagrasses and corals under those different habitat and uh, different scenarios. This shows the one of those models that I talked about, the coastal protection model, under these different scenarios of development and the associated habitat change, the loss, the erosion rates that were modeled on these different sort of landmark positions we pick on shore. And you can just basically see the message here is that as you lose more of these protective habitats, you can quantify and see spatial variation in where the erosion rates are going to be greater along the shoreline. So it helps give them a sense of where, where development might be more vulnerable or infrastructure if certain types of these habitats are lost for due to different activities. So but what if you ask a, a whole suite of services and how those change and how might the development affect not only the erosion and flooding, but also recreation values and habitat for key species and fisheries, in this case, the limited lobster. So those same scenarios and the same key that I just highlighted here, this is Amber Green Key again, this is lobster annual catch and revenue. So it shows, they, they really wanted to look at a couple of different kinds of metrics of value. So th this one here is pounds of landed lobster in 2025. So how is that likely to change just the overall amount, biomass of lobster landed under these different scenarios? They also were curious about the revenues generated from that catch. So these are gross export revenues, lobster's a big export for the region. So you can see that the, the conservation scenario is better for lobster for biomass and pounds of landed, not so good over here. Those are the associated habitat changes that gave rise to that. Oh yeah, so I didn't say, you know, underneath each of these models, maps is a model, so there's a lobster model that relates lobster population dynamics to those habitat changes. This one is tourism. Again, same three scenarios on Amber Green Key. And this one is an interesting approach. Um, I don't know if I have, I might have the slide in here, but this is actually a, a methodological, this is where we were providing, we were learning a lot from the decision making groups because they were asking us very specific questions and saying what sort of metrics they wanted. They wanted both visitor days and how those were going to change because they care about just how many people want to come to Belize. But they also wanted revenues from that. So what are the total expenditures? And in order to do that, we needed to work out a new methodology that Spencer Wood has done using clicker data. It's very hard to get visitation rate data and relate it to environmental attributes. So if you want to know more about this approach that he developed, I can share it with you and get you to talk to Spencer, who's in Seattle, actually. Oh, yeah, so here's one. I guess I did have this here. Here's one of the validation tests he's been doing with these clicker data, where he gets photos from the geotag huge database from around the world. We can correlate them to the local environmental attributes using really simple regression techniques. And then he's tested it with actual visitation rates in different places, and the fits are really good. So he thinks this is going to be a good approach to these um, all over the world, which is what we're looking for. Okay, and then to, to just summarize, this is actually a page from the Belize government coastal zone management plan, which they've now um, put out for approval for all their ministries and they expect approval next week. So what they basically did is they have recommended this center informed management, which is sort of a loaded term. It's kind of presupposing the result. But what they did is they iterated many times with us between these two scenarios until the model results that our models gave them, and they ended up running the models after we trained them on it, were what the people in the regions of these different keys would approve, would approve. So it shows the three main services, so lobster fisheries, recreation, and coastal protection. 
And what one thing you might imagine is, if you just cared about recreation, you would really want maybe the development scenario, but now actually the expenditures are higher in the informed management scenario because they're not getting negative feedback from destruction of reefs and mangroves and sea glass habitat. So it, by looking at multiple objectives, it really did make the group land on this middle middle development scenario and form of management that's not quite exactly halfway between these two is a little bit closer to conservation. So the lesson learned here was they didn't always want dollars. They really cared about lobster fishing communities and how would they be distributed throughout the country. They didn't want to just know total revenues. And they also didn't just care about tourism. They didn't want to have their reefs and mangroves be destroyed just to get more visitors. So it really was a good learning experience for us and um, it made me a little less cynical about them than planning, honestly. Okay, one more example and then we'll, um, we'll all kind of come back to the original question. So this is really different. So this is going to be a watershed in Colombia and some of you may have heard Heather Tallis speak here last week. You'll, you'll, some of this will be familiar. The reason I chose this as an example is that it's a payment scheme. So instead of spatial planning and trying to avoid conflicts in space in the ocean, this is really an eco-compensation scheme where people are trying to establish water funds which are um, groups of public and private entities, so governments, private landowners, and public, um, in this case a city that wants a clean water supply. And they set up a fund and they want to help us help decide how to invest their fund, which in this case, this is the Calpa Valley watershed in Colombia, the sample I'll show you. They have $10 million over three years to invest in the upper watershed to improve water quality downstream for their city. So they want to know what activities should they invest in in the upper watershed, where and what is the estimated return on the investment to help them set the investment level. Um, this is relevant to ocean people interested in ocean and marine environments because there are some compensation schemes and payment for ecosystem service schemes being set up in marine environments that are not just fishery cap share oriented that we can talk about. But they're not very well developed and this one is well developed so it's a big analog I think. So these are the stakeholders as I mentioned. Um, big Coca-Cola bottling company and some sugar cane growing private sector and then the city of um, in this case, Calca down below, and um, a peace group, which I'll tell you more about if you want to know. I think I've told that story for many Okay, so this, just to remind you, we've got lots of different service models underlying these maps and results, I'll say. So this just shows you the sediment retention schematic, so we're not doing coastal protection services now, we're looking at sediment retention. So you have a DEM, a watershed um, sort of layer that shows the bit, um, topography and has soil type and slope and vegetation on the landscape and it basically models with precipitation and a couple of other simple physical inputs how much retention occurs on different pixels of the landscape as a function of the vegetation, the slope, the aspect and um, how much precipitation there is during what time of the year. And then that models over each sort of subcatchment and pixel, how much erosion occurs and therefore how much sediment gets delivered to the stream. Same basic approach for nutrients. And then we generate models with the um, maps with the models showing which parts of the landscape the water yield, the source of the water is the greatest, and then sediment export. This isn't very well zoomed in, but this will shows you where the big erosion events occur in the watershed. And then what you can do then is take those spatial information about where the services are provided now and what happens when you invest different amounts of money in the <coughs> watershed in very specific activities and ask how does the service, this shows two services, one is a reduction in the erosion rate in the green here that gets higher as you get, the erosion reduction is greater as the investment increases and then the average annual water yield is actually going a little bit lower. So there's a trade-off here that is pretty commonly understood in hydrology. But it is asymptotic. So this, this kind of graph helps this particular catchment decide 
at what level of, um, of the investment you're not going to get a big return anymore in erosion control in this case. And then if you look at a whole suite of these, you can see that the functions, the relative change in the service, either green erosion control or red water yield, is variable across watersheds in this system. So some have a nice asymptote and you can see where they might stop the investment because you're not going to get a greater return. Others are still increasing and um, have very different shapes. So it just shows the spatial heterogeneity and what kind of returns you might get from investments in the upper watershed in terms of cleaner water down downstream. So going back to one particular of these subcatchments that has that return um, on investment curve in the left, then you can look at spatially what where the different activities were arrayed in that watershed. And the important thing here is the the groups then, the funds, shift these maps once they've iterated enough and they get, they've gotten comfortable with what they think the model results are saying and it looks reasonable. Then they ask citizens in the watershed to volunteer to say, yes, I would like some of your fund to put up fencing or do riparian planting or change my silviculture practice, whatever the activities are. And that those are targeted in these highlighted areas where the returns are likely to be the greatest. And now monitoring is ongoing, so we'll see if the model results actually do turn out to be true once those activities are put in place. One, this is the, the, why the peace group is important. The stakeholders give you really important feedback. So this was one of the early iterations we did, and they said don't put any activities up there, because even if we gave people money, they wouldn't do it because it's too dangerous because the park gorillas are very active in that place. So that helped us iterate again and find some activities that would still give them a fairly good return without going into um, not, not sort of feasible areas for these activities. So things you never expect to come through these stakeholder processes. And then just quickly to close this one. So in this payment scheme, this return on investment um, analysis that was led by Heather Tallis and a bunch of colleagues, it, it takes time. I mean, it's data intensive and you have to do extra iterations with the stakeholder group, in this case the secretariats for the funds. So, so they asked whether or not it was worth it. And what this shows is the ratio of sort of random investments in the watershed and what was the return in terms of improved sediment and nutrient loadings in the water versus the targeted one through these these models. And you can see that the, the ratio of the return of a, of a using a prioritized science approach versus not can go up to over four fourfold improvement in the return on investment if you use this prioritized approach. So this is again, this is all modeled, so we have to monitor it and see what really happens, but they've been using this to justify why they want to now scale this up. And we're now developing this similar tool for them to do 30 new water funds in five years. So we had helped them with two or three over a two-year period, and now they want to really scale up. So we're training people in use of the tools and setting up monitoring protocols for them. So they can try to set up these very similar sets of public-private investments into upper watersheds and try to get, see if they can get those same kind of funds set up in all these places throughout Latin America. So that's kind of our model, is this is the oldest project set we have. We learn something in a place, see what works, see what kind of metrics and inputs really resonate with the, the partner, and then really try to scale it up in a much more tailored, simple way so that it can be replicated by the people on the ground and not us, because we're, we're just the, the engine that tries to figure out with the first partner how the method might be applied and then let other people um, replicate it and scale it up. Okay, so that's, those are the two examples I really wanted to share with you and I just wanted to come back to this map and show you really, really quickly just a smattering of some of the other decision contexts and places where we're working because we really have purposefully picked really different places biophysically, ge geographically, but also decision types to see how can natural capital information change decisions. 
And we just did a, a, a retrospective analysis of our 20 sites so far. And these are what we've learned so far about. If you want to try to operationalize this idea of including natural capital in decisions, um, this is what we're finding so far, that simple models actually are, are fine. There, I, I'd love to talk more if you're interested. So there's always a better single service model. There's always a better hydrology model and fisheries models to pick two that have much more sophisticated approaches than what we do. But what typically happens is these groups that we work with want a, a whole suite of benefits looked at and trade-offs among them. So in many cases, we'll swap out a better local fishery model or a better hydrology model, but in looking at a whole bunch of services, they can use ours to sort of fill in the gaps. And the science policy process really matters for making this work because you have to figure out what metrics they need, what time scales, and what do they really care about. Do they care about dollars? Do they care about people or both? So value metrics are not all dollars, as I mentioned before. And then Taylor two tools will help take our approach to scale. So that's the example of that water time that I talked about. So this is our early findings from looking at our 20 sites that we've worked on for the past five years. And it's interesting, I was just in New York last week, and this whole group of financiers who've been thinking about environmental markets, they have come to the same conclusion that we have, that in most cases, looking at ecosystem services in decisions is not going to be a market-driven process. It's going to be much more looking at multiple objectives and trade-offs rather than trying to monetize everything and put it into a formal market. So that was interesting that they had come to the same conclusion. So here's, just to hit on a couple of our findings from that retrospective we just looked at, these are some of the kinds of value metrics that people have wanted in our in our demonstration. So a couple of market goods, if it's timber or crop yields or fisheries, but in many cases, it's they just want the biophysical metrics if it's a nutrient loading problem, or they just want to know, can I have access to my sacred place? And that's all they want to know. They don't want to put a dollar value on that, and we're very happy about that. So this is the summary of all the decision contexts that we've worked in so far and the kinds of questions that the partners are asking. So you can see it's pretty diverse. It's not always what's the market value of something. The, the different <coughs> players are different. But it's, it's the common element among all of these is that they want spatial information. So they want to know where is the service being provided, where might it be lost, and where are the people who <coughs> will gain or lose. And they also want to have some kind of quantification so they can compare across um, different scenarios. That's the common elements of all of our engagements. So just to hit on a couple others, this is one example of a restoration one we've done where we've looked at oyster reef restorations in the Gulf of Mexico. This is working with the Nature Conservancy. And they were able to use these models to help them design how big the reef was, how much it stuck out of the water, and how long it needed to be with the break in between oyster reefs so they could get fishery benefits and erosion benefits for marshes. And they've actually monitored this and already seen returns in terms of reduced erosion and fishery benefits. So that was a nice quick one that they did themselves with, with our models. We just sort of did a little bit of guidance and training. Um, this is very far from the ocean, but we've been working a lot in China where they're really scaling up. This is one of the great things about China and all the amazing science that's going on there is that if you do a couple of trainings there, you have hundreds of people using and testing and modifying this open source tool and really improving the inner workings of the models. But there's a lot of eco-compensation, they call it there, going on in the Tibetan plateau to look at paying some of these yak grazers to reduce places where they graze their yaks and compensating them for that so that the water returns downstream or improves. And then um, there's a Hood Canal project. I just wanted to mention it, that we're working here in Hood Canal more locally, looking at shellfish returns, so shellfish growing areas, how long are they open and what are the returns in those regions and how much the watershed activities affect those or not. So I'm not going to go into any more details on that when we've got